God! It was an unforgettable day, I can tell you that. By all accounts, it was a regular Saturday night dinner. Even young Rachel was there, staying with us for the weekend, as she often did. I suppose I'd better explain why Rachel was there. Rachel's mother, Andorra, who, by the way, I'd never met at the time, was a widow and worked almost every weekend as a cab controller. Otterly and Rachel had become best friends in high school, and from then on it was common for them to sleep over at each other's houses. Eventually it became standard procedure, with Rachel sleeping over on Fridays and Saturdays while her mother worked 12-hour night shifts and carved out a few hours to sleep during the day. Marge, Otterly's mother, and my ex-wife obviously knew Andorra well, but to be honest, I never saw her at the time. Not for any particular reason that I can name, except that Marge thought the lovely Andorra would turn my head. It was just the way things were. I was traveling a lot at the time. The company I was working for was young, and we were trying to grab a piece of the market that had been tightly packed with other suppliers for years. As it happened, Marge was dropping off and picking up the kids all the time. On Sundays, though, Rachel was often picked up from our house in any of the cabs that passed by. I think Rachel liked that the cab drivers who came to pick her up were spoiled with sweets, ice cream, etc. However, Otterly didn't mind when they came to pick Rachel up either. She usually got the same treats they did. Where was I? Oh yes, that infamous Saturday night dinner. The four of us were sitting around the table eating. Marge had just served us sweets, and I think I had just returned to the table after putting away the main course dishes in the kitchen. Anyway, without thinking about the fact that there were two girls sitting with us, and without any prior warning or preparation, Marge suddenly announced, Pete, I want a divorce! I'm leaving you! Then she settles into her sweetheart like she didn't drop the biggest brick she could think of on my head. Excuse me? I think that was the end of my response. When your wife, with whom you have lived for ten years, suddenly makes a statement like that in a conversation, your first reaction is to wonder if your ears have deceived you. I said I want a divorce. I found someone else and I want to spend the rest of my life with him. And what the hell could I possibly say to such a statement? Not forgetting, of course, that there were two impressionable eight-year-old girls sitting at the table with us, one of whom was our daughter, watching my every word and or physical action. I believe that under the circumstances I displayed that day, the exceptional self-control and patience of a saint. Upon reflection, I have always been proud of the self-control I displayed. I sat there for a while, going over Marge's words in my mind, until I convinced myself that I wasn't crazy, that she just said she wanted me out of her life. I must have made some stupid statement like, if that's the case, I'm going apartment hunting tomorrow, or something like that. Remember, I was in a state of shock at the time, so my recollection of the details is probably somewhat faulty. Anyway, I said something about going to move out of the house, but Marge came back with a real hammy. No, you'll have to keep the house. I won't need it, and you'll need it for Otterly. I stopped pretending to eat the rapidly melting ice cream on my plate and stared at Marjorie. We're going on a trip around the world, and Otterly at her age can't afford to miss all her schoolwork, added Marge nonchalantly, not even raising her eyes from her dish. You've got to be kidding me, I replied in a rather louder voice than I intended. Look, I wasn't holding back my emotions for Marge's sake, but for the sake of the two impressionable girls at the table with us. On reflection, Marge probably decided to make her statement during the meal because she knew full well that I would hold back in front of the children. I want to see the world while I'm still young enough to enjoy it, replied Marjorie, completely unaware of the irony in her words. At this point, words failed me, and if it weren't for the seriousness of the situation, I might well have burst into laughter. You see, when Marge and I first met, I was very passionate about traveling. I grew up with the plan that when I finished my engineering degree, I would travel the world for a few years before settling down. When Marge came into my life, I saw no need to change that plan. I imagined Marge and I traveling to exotic places together. Marge, however, saw things a little differently. Yes, like me, she longed to see the world. The Grand Canyon, the Rocky Mountains, and the huge redwood trees that grow there. We even talked about places like Ayers Rock and Oz and the North Island of New Zealand, with its boiling mud pools and stuff. A buddy of mine from New Zealand used to tell us about his ski trips to the South Island. It always sounded fun, at least a little more exotic than the Alps. But Marge had a slightly different game plan than I did. I assumed that we would get married and leave as soon as we got our diplomas, using the savings that we and I had managed to stash away. 
I figured we'd travel for a couple of years or so and then come back to the UK, settle down and have kids. That's assuming we didn't find another place we wanted to settle while traveling. Marge planned to have children first. Ironically, while I'm young enough to enjoy them, was exactly what she said. Irony or what? At the time, I thought I understood Marge's position. Her parents were already quite old when her mother gave birth to her, and she was always aware of that fact. Anyway, Marge's idea was that when the kids were out of the nest, we would travel the world together. Apparently, Marjorie had changed her mind. Maybe taking care of Otterly wasn't as much fun as she thought it would be. I know that the pregnancy and the birth itself was not to her liking. The idea of having three children was quickly dropped from the master plan as soon as Otterly was born, without much discussion with anyone that I was aware of. I think that's when I almost broke down, but I couldn't laugh out loud, although in retrospect I should have. I couldn't sit there and listen to Marge's ramblings any longer, or I'm sure I would have snapped and done something I'd regret for a long time. I just got up from the table and went out into the garden, where for some reason, probably out of habit and because it was just a job that had to be done, I started pruning the roses. I don't know how long it was before I realized I had company. First, I noticed Rachel's hand. I think she had started trimming the bush next to the one I was working on. Then I noticed Otterly working on the bush on the other side of me. Neither of the girls said anything to signal their arrival. Watch out for thorns, girls. You're not wearing gardening gloves, I automatically warned. We'll be careful, Dad, replied Otterly. What does your mom do? I asked as if offhandedly. I don't know why I asked my daughter that, but it was another automatic answer. I think she's upstairs packing, Otterly replied calmly, as if this was a common occurrence. Suddenly, I was so angry again that I couldn't keep pruning the damn roses. I was afraid that if I did, I would rip off the fresh flowers as well. I stepped back and watched the girls. True, I wanted to rush upstairs and throw Marjorie off. But not so much for announcing out of the blue that she was leaving me. Rather for the fact that she had effectively declared to our daughter that she didn't want Otterly to go with her. I couldn't understand how any mother, much less my wife, could do that to her child. Sorry, Otterly, said I without any further explanation. Why, Daddy, you didn't decide to leave us, but Mom did? My daughter replied, obviously understanding the point of my apology. Most of the kids at school are their dads who have left. I'd rather stay with a dad who loves me than a mom who... Otterly didn't finish the sentence, and I still wonder what she meant to say. I've always wondered, but I suppose I'll never know what I've missed over the years. Could Marjorie have somehow let Otterly know that she didn't love her? Marge always seemed to me to be a loving mother to Otterly. She also seemed to tenderly care for Rachel whenever she was in the house. But if I was blind enough not to notice that my wife had a gorgeous man stashed away somewhere, I had to wonder what else I was missing. But perhaps Marjorie Otterly's words conveyed that her mother doesn't love her, just because she doesn't take Otterly with her. Suddenly I noticed that both girls were working together on the same rose bush. Moreover, they were holding hands. One was pulling out dead rose heads, and the other was taking them from her and throwing them into a basket. Almost at the same moment I realized I could hear Marjorie talking to someone, probably her new man, on the phone in the bedroom. The windows were open because the day was warm. I couldn't hear what she was saying to him, but knowing that children often have much better hearing than adults, I figured the girls could probably do it. Ice cream, I announced loudly. Come on, girls, let's get ourselves the biggest ice cream we can find, shall we? I knew they had just had ice cream for dessert. My own had melted as I put it on the plate. But it was the best idea my confused brain could come up with on such short notice. Both girls burst into joyful shouts and immediately seemed to forget about the roses and began cheering each other on. I had never noticed them doing this before. I found myself walking to the car with an eight-year-old girl galloping on either side of me, each holding onto one of my hands. To make it a little more special, I didn't take the girls to one of the local fast food places. We don't have a proper ice cream store in our town. Instead, I went to one of the many restaurants in our town and ordered their Sunday's ice cream to eat in the desert. I doubted any of the kids would be able to finish them all the way through. How wrong I was. It took some time for them to absorb, and that proved to be helpful to me. I began to get over the shock of Marjorie's sudden announcement and come to terms with what Marge was doing to us, and evaluating what the immediate and long-term consequences would be. For some inexplicable reason, I found that I personally didn't care that Marjorie was leaving.
Yes, I would miss her, but... Any love I had for this woman was instantly destroyed by her announcement and the way she did it in front of Otterly. But with her leaving, I had a big problem. Childcare. Oh, I was sure I could look after Otterly, but I needed someone to take her to and from school every day. I was sure my employers would help in any way they could, but our work hours were 9 to 5, while school hours were 9 to 3. And who the hell was going to look after Otterly during the vacations? Rachel? Well, I was sorry, but I had my own problems and her mother would have to deal with hers as best she could. I remember thinking that I would have to call her later and explain the situation. The only plan I could think of was my sister. Carol lived pretty far away, but maybe she could somehow pick Otterly up from school in the afternoons, even if it meant a long drive for both of us. The only drawback I could see was Carol's own children. Perhaps they were finishing school at the same time as Otterly. I pulled out my cell phone and called Carol. Maybe if I threw the ball into her court, she'd come up with some plan. Carol was always pretty good at this sort of thing. What did she do? shouted Carol into my phone as I explained Marjorie's statement as briefly as possible, trying not to go into details, what I knew of them, because the girls were sitting at the table with me. I was actually surprised myself at how little I had learned from what Marjorie had said. I had no idea how long her affair had lasted, and I didn't even know who she'd had it with. Carol, I told you Marge ran off with some guy and left us. Who, what guy? demanded Carol. I have no idea, Carol, just some Casanova she picked up somewhere, I guess. I didn't bother to ask. His name is Ronald, announced Otterly, taking me by surprise. He's a library customer, added Rachel, apparently not wanting to fall behind. Marge had been working part-time at the library for months, just to make money and get out of the house, so she said. I stared at the two girls, who were still sitting there nonchalantly devouring their giant popsicles, while repeating their words to Carol. But my problem is Carol. I have no idea what I'm going to do about picking up Otterly from school every day. I can drop her off in the mornings and get into the office a little later, but there's no way I can finish at half past two every day. It's okay, Daddy. Rachel's mom is picking me up from school. Otterly pointed this out with the logic of a child, and before Carol could respond. It wouldn't be fair to ask her to do that every day, Otterly. I tried to explain to the kid. Oh, that won't be a problem, Otterly informed me. We've thought of everything, haven't we, Rachel? Rachel looked up from her ice cream, nodded, and then smirked at me. Somehow I realized for the first time that these two girls were quietly conspiring with each other. But where they found the time or the opportunity that day, I had no idea. Rachel will stay at our house on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, Otterly explained and I'll stay with Rachel and her mom the rest of the school nights. On Mondays, you can drive us to school, and Rachel's mom will pick us up when she gets out of bed after lunch. Otterly threw me one of those childishly satisfied, easy and simple, problem-solved looks. I don't know what expression was on my face as I sat there in amazement. Carol must have overheard Otterly's words, however, because she said, I think it's a brilliant plan, Pete. Did you ask her? No, Carol, for some reason I never thought of that. I've never met Rachel's mother, and the idea never crossed my mind. Frankly, I have no idea if she would agree to it. It's too big a request. The cab driver has been asking my mom to work on Sundays for a while now. Rachel suddenly joined the conversation. Mom said that by working on Sundays in the cab, she'd get more money than at the store. But she didn't want to impose on Mama Otterly by asking her to look after me. Reading between the lines of Rachel's words, I realized that her mother must be working part-time at the store sometime during the week. God, that woman must work around the clock, I thought to myself. I think the kids have solved your problem. What does Otterly's friend's mother look like? I have no idea. You know, I've never met the lady, Carol. I had to be careful what I said because I already knew that the two little innocents sitting on the other side of the table were scrutinizing my every word. Well, brother. I'd say you'd better go over there and have a chat with Rachel's mother as soon as possible and find out what she thinks of the children's plan. Returning to the subject of Marjorie, Carol asked, Has that bitch moved out of the house yet? I have no idea, Carol. The girls and I are at a restaurant in town. I took them out for ice cream before... Yeah, well, you know. But I think she was packing up when we left. I'd say you'd better get some new door locks while you're in town. 
I'm sure you don't need the cow trying to come back. Call me later if you need anything tonight, Pete, or Frank and I can come over later if you want. But if we both come, we'll have to bring the kids with us. Thank you, Carol, but I don't think it will be necessary. You know, I think all the help I'm going to need this evening is sitting here with me right now. The two girls grinned at each other, then at me, and finally greeted each other again. I was to see them do this many times over the next few months. Only at the time I had no idea what the little fools were really up to. Another thing I hadn't noticed was that Carol not only wasn't surprised to learn that Marjorie was leaving me, she wasn't particularly upset about it. But I would never say that the two women got along well together, and they certainly couldn't be called close friends. After finishing the ice cream, we went back to the car. But I still didn't go home. I had a rather delicate mission to accomplish first. I needed to inform Rachel's mother that I would be the only adult in the house with the girls that evening, and assure her that she was okay with it. There are some pretty strange personalities these days, and as far as I knew, Rachel's mother had never caught my eye. I pulled up outside the cab office and, leaving the girls in the car, went inside to find Rachel's mother. My name is Pete Thomas and I'm looking for young Rachel's mother. I turned to the cabbie sitting behind the counter, who I thought vaguely remembered picking Rachel up from home one Sunday afternoon. This may seem strange, but at the time I had no idea what Rachel's mother's name really was. Both Marge and Otterly always called her Rachel's mother, and Rachel always called her mom. A few guys, obviously cab drivers on break, were sitting in old armchairs drinking tea or coffee. I felt like I was immediately the center of attention for all of them as soon as I mentioned Rachel. All attention was focused on the TV playing in the corner of the office, and conversation stopped abruptly at the sound of her name. She is currently in her private office and will be back soon. The guy behind the counter smiled at me and gestured to a door with a ladies-only sign, on which, however, some weirdo had pasted a piece of paper that read, Andorra office. I stood and waited, trying not to show that I'd noticed that everyone there was studying me intently. It seemed like an eternity until the door finally opened and I got the surprise of my life. I don't know how I expected to see Rachel's mother, but it certainly wasn't what she really looked like. Not that she was dressed to the highest standard. In fact, she was wearing just a pair of old jeans, very tight fitting, and an equally blue blouse, tight on her figure. But damn, she was one of those women with looks. She'd look good in an old bag, too. Add to that the flawless makeup, not too elaborate to emphasize her facial features, and not a single carelessly styled hair. God, this woman looked like a runway model. She glided along with the same grace, style, or whatever you call it, that they did. I could understand why all these drivers had shown interest in my asking about her, and perhaps why they were all hanging around outside the cab office. Andorra, there's a guy here to see you said the man behind the counter. Hey, Pete, is something wrong? She asked with a wide smile on her face, but with perhaps a slightly concerned tone in her voice. Yeah. No, well, maybe, I replied, nervously looking around at all the guys, who by then were pretending not to look or listen to us. But Rachel is fine, and there's nothing to worry about. I just think I should let you know what's going on, that's all. Can we talk somewhere private? Instantly, all the guys started getting up from their seats, I guess to go outside and leave us alone in the office. But Andor told them to stay, and we went outside. What's up, Peter? Don't you look too smart? said Andor as the door closed behind us. But then she noticed the girls huddled against the car window and waved at them. The problem is... Andorra! Marjorie left me! I stammered. I felt very strange talking to her, and even calling her Andorra, since it was the first time we had met. I was also confused that she recognized me immediately and knew who I was. I was sure we had never met before. My God, poor thing, was her first reaction. Then her mind must have realized the possible consequences. Does this mean we have a childcare problem tonight? Oh no, Andorra. I was still having trouble with that name. It's just that we've never met, and I thought... Well, I don't know what I thought. I think you should know that I'll be watching the kids alone tonight. I just thought you should know, after all, we are complete strangers. Not so much, Peter. Rachel talks about you all the time. You may not realize it, but she treats you like a surrogate father. She even has a picture of you along with a picture of my husband next to her bed. Oh my God, where did she get that? Otterly gave it to her, I guess. 
Anyway, do you want me to take the day off and take the girls or something? I can if you want to be alone. Oh, God, no. No, I just thought it would be wise to let you know the bill. If they hadn't come this afternoon, I'd have been in a complete mess. I'm fine looking after Rachel. I was just a little worried that you should know. I'm sure Rachel couldn't be in better hands, Peter. She reached out and took my hand, as if to emphasize it. I'll come and get Rachel in the morning. No, you need to get some sleep. Five hours as usual would be just fine. But maybe you can stop by and see me on your own, because we really need to discuss what's going to happen in the future. If you want, I can bring Rachel home. Oh, yes. The future. I hadn't thought of that. Andor replied, and an even more concerned expression appeared on her face. The possible long-term consequences of Marjorie leaving me must have suddenly crossed her mind. Don't worry, I think we can work something out. The girls are already full of ideas. I smiled at her as best I could. Andor looked a little relieved. Oh yes, but I'll take Rachel. I'm sure you'll have plenty of things you need to focus on. Thank you, yes, I guess that's the way it is, if only I could figure them out. I'll see you tomorrow night then, and please don't worry about Rachel. She's a wonderful girl. Aren't they both? commented Andor as we walked to the car, where she had a word with the girls, kissing them goodnight and telling them to behave themselves. When we pulled up to the house, an unfamiliar car was parked in my driveway. Marjorie got out of it and pulled up as I pulled up to the curb. Where have you been? I've been waiting here for you for hours, she demanded, after which she curtly informed us that she was on her way out. Honestly, even after the bombshell she had dropped on me earlier, I couldn't relate her behavior and speech to the woman I had been married to for so long. If this is who I think it is, I suggest you tell the bastard to get his car out of my driveway before I move it for him. I responded just as sharply. I was actually very close to the target, and I was extremely annoyed with Marjorie for having this guy there when we got back. What a way to rub my nose in it, I thought. In retrospect, I think I had impeccable control of my emotions that day. Admittedly, mostly because the kids were around. But it seemed to me that Marjorie was trying to get me to come clean. Perhaps she could use it as some kind of justification for her actions, if for no one else. Marjorie made a gesture with her hand, and the Jaguar started up with a roar, then slid out of the driveway and parked across the street. Ignoring the fact that Marjorie was standing next to the car, I put it in reverse and swung across the street to reverse into the spot where the Jaguar was parked. Marjorie complained that I almost hit her as I got out of the car. Oh, you're still here. I thought you left. I lied and went to the front door. But then I stopped and turned to look at her. Aren't you taking this? I demanded, gesturing to the little Nissan that Marjorie usually drove. It suddenly popped into my mind that the Jaguar was stuffed to the brim with Marjorie's stuff, and the Nissan was empty. I don't see the point. You'd better sell it. We're flying out of the country on Wednesday, she replied. Where? Where do I send my divorce papers, I thought. But Marge beat me to it. Ronnie's lawyer's address is on the kitchen table. He'll know where to contact us. She replied curtly, and then turned to speak to Otterly, who, along with Rachel, had also gotten out of the car by then. I'm afraid I didn't wait to see what they had to say to each other, and my daughter and I have never discussed the subject since. But it couldn't have been anything special, because a few seconds later, both girls followed me into the house and shut the door tightly. What I didn't see, but heard, somewhere in the back of my mind, was the distinct slap of their hands as the little devils high-fived each other again. I'm afraid to say that at that moment I didn't pay any attention to the sound. The girls and I settled down on the couch and watched a little TV, after which I told them that I thought it was time for them to go to bed. They both gave me a quick kiss on the cheek and then went to bed without argument. As I recall, that was a first on Otterly's part. I have no idea what time I ended up going to bed, although I admit I had a couple of whiskeys that night to help me sleep. Sunday morning I awoke to the familiar smell of frying bacon permeating the house. For a moment I forgot that Marjorie had left and looked at the clock, wondering if she had gotten up first on Sunday. Then the memories of the previous day came over me, and I looked around the room. Something about it was wrong or out of place, but for a few seconds I couldn't figure out what it was. And then I realized that when I had gone to bed, there had been signs of Marjorie's departure everywhere. The drawers of the dresser had been half open, the closet doors ajar. 
Now they weren't just closed all signs that Marjorie had ever existed were gone from sight. Even the damned pictures of her mother and father, which I remembered noticing when I noticed she'd left, weren't on the dressing table, now completely empty. I got out of bed and headed to the bathroom to do my usual ablutions. And to my even greater surprise, the personal items I was sure Marjorie had left there were gone as well. I had to assume that while I was sleeping, I had guests coming over to clean up, and I only had two possible culprits I could think of. Come on, Dad. Is breakfast getting cold? I heard Otterly call out to me from the stairs as I walked out of my bedroom. Waiting for me in the kitchen were both eight-year-olds who insisted I sit down while they served them. I was served fries with a glass of fresh orange juice and a cup of coffee, served as if I were having breakfast in an upscale hotel. The two girls apparently settled for cornflakes, orange juice, and tea. I made the requisite enthusiastic comments about the fine breakfast and the skill of the chiefs and was rewarded with broad smiles on the faces of both girls. Carol, her husband Frank, and their children arrived before we had finished our meal. Their arrival broke the enchantment, and the calm, a bit. But it was obvious that their arrival had been anticipated, or the girls had grossly overestimated my coffee consumption, because Otterly and Rachel quickly set Carol and Frank's coffee mugs down. It took me some coaxing to convince the two girls to leave the dishwashing to me and go play with Carol's kids. Carol busied herself with washing the dishes, while Frank and I sat drinking coffee and watching the scene while detailing to them the previous day. My sister and her husband told me they would do everything they could to help. Frank gave me the name and details of the lawyer who had represented his sister in the divorce. She turned out to be a good choice. Carol made dinner for everyone from what she found in the freezer and refrigerator. I think I spent most of the day tending to my roses when I wasn't talking to Carol and Frank. One thing I did remember that day, however, was that Rachel and Otterly helped me mess around with the roses a bit in the afternoon. And I also remembered Rachel, either by coincidence or on purpose, quoting a line from the song, It's been a good year for the roses. I'm sure she was too young to realize the parallels that could be drawn between the song and the events of the previous day. But I sure did. I will never know if I reacted in any way when Rachel said those words. But I do know that, consciously or not, Rachel has repeated that phrase often over the years. Both girls seem to love the song itself, and we hear them playing and or singing it quite often. Which is even weirder, especially if someone mentions Marjorie. The cab pulled up to the house around 4.30, and Andor got out of it. The girls let her into the house and we got acquainted. Then Carol, Andorra, and I went into the living room, and Frank kicked all the children out into the garden and kept them busy. Andorra felt sorry for me for what had happened, and before I could say anything, Carol informed Andorra of the girl's plan for babysitting. Andor confirmed that she had mentioned to Rachel in passing that she had been asked to work as a supervisor on the Sunday night shift at the taxi stand, and said that she would get more money that way than she would for four morning hours at the local convenience store where she worked. Almost without further discussion or much change, it was decided to follow the plan the children had outlined to me the night before. With some vague discussion that Carol would help with daycare for both girls, a couple of days a week during school vacations, etc. Andor called the boss of the taxi company to check with him that she could take an extra shift. He was obviously over the moon and asked her to start work that evening. She looked at me for some reason for confirmation. I just smiled and nodded, so she agreed. It wasn't that simple because Rachel needed school clothes for the next day. So Carol drove Andor and Rachel home to pick them up, and Otterly insisted on going with her. As I carried Rachel's bag into the house from Carol and Frank's car, a thought struck me. Andor, do you drive? I asked. Yeah, but since Tony left, I can't afford to keep a car, she replied. How do you like the little Micra as a get-around car? I asked. Andor stopped and looked at Marjorie's car parked beside the road. I can't, she replied. Why not, since she doesn't need it? She told me to get rid of the damn thing. You'll need it too, since you're going to be racing Otterly to and from school every day. Are you sure? She asked. Come on, I insisted. Let's call the insurance company and put you on my policy as a driver. We'll put Marjorie on my policy too, and let Roland the Rat deal with all her insurance. His name is Ronald, Dad, Otterly corrected me. Who cares what his name is? He's a Roland Rat to me, I replied, perhaps somewhat sharply. He can't be dad, he's a rolling rat, funny and cute. I was corrected. Well, 
I couldn't argue with my daughter's logic, so I relented and changed things up a bit. Okay, if you insist, it'll be Ronald the Rat. I smiled at her. For those not in the know, Roland the Rat was a puppet character on a morning television news show at the time. Over the next few weeks, we all got used to the new routine. Although Carol, often with Frank and the kids, would show up on Saturday mornings to check the contents of the pantry and advise me to restock it, she usually finished cooking and lunch unless we went out to eat. And yes, that's right. Carol never actually wore white gloves, but she did tend to make captain's rounds while she was in the house. Housework isn't exactly my forte, but I soon found that I didn't have much to do in the evenings when Otterly wasn't home. I tried to do little and often, and I think the house was almost always in sight. Carol, at any rate, never found cause for criticism. On weekdays I was lonely, but over time I got used to it. Fridays, when I came home from work and found Andorra and the girls there, it was great. Very quickly, Andorra started cooking food for all of us before she went to her Friday night shift. The bad times came during the week, especially when I came home from work to an empty house and woke up in the morning. Never mind the resentment I felt toward Marjorie for what she had done. When after all these years of marriage, you suddenly find yourself waking up alone in bed every morning? Gosh, it just takes some getting used to. There were some complications with the divorce. Marge and her gorgeous man had left the country and apparently traveled extensively. I have read that, judging from the fact that Marge's attorney has had a hard time keeping in touch with her, it is possible that her beau is intentionally trying to make things difficult. Eventually, I discovered that his very distraught wife was demanding that he pay child support for their children. I met with her one day when both she and my attorneys were meeting for a council of war. But frankly, I had my own problems and didn't want to get involved. I know she eventually managed to block all his accounts in British banks, and I believe she eventually got all his assets in the UK. Without interfering, I helped in any way I could by informing her attorney of Marge's whereabouts when she called home to speak to our daughter. Credit for getting that information must go to Otterly, though, because she became adept at prying Marge's exact whereabouts when she called. And then, not very cleverly, the little rascal would pass that information on to me at the first opportunity. Whether Otterly knew the reason I needed that information or not, I don't know. Oddly enough, the difficulties Marjorie's attorney was having were to my advantage. After another court hearing at which Marjorie's solicitor asked the judge for another adjournment because he was waiting to hear from Marjorie on some matter, the old man lost his temper. He demanded to know where Marjorie was and when the poor solicitor had to admit that he had no idea. The judge turned to me to ask if I had any knowledge of her whereabouts. I'm sorry, sir. I replied, rising to my feet. But I have not spoken or communicated directly with my wife since the day she decided to leave me and my daughter. I answered as best I could, glossing over the fact of Otterly's desertion, and formally, since there had been no word between Marjorie and me since her departure, telling the truth. I kind of forgot to mention that Marjorie called Otterly every three weeks or so. But that's not what the judge asked me, is it? And you know how these assholes push you to answer their questions unvarnished. I don't know exactly, but I have to assume the old man was having a bad day or something. Or maybe the old git was presiding over a divorce from Marjorie's posh man and lost his patience. Suddenly I heard him say, Unreasonable behavior, my grounds for divorce, can be interpreted in many ways. Briefly, he said that Marjorie's failure to communicate with her own attorney was one of them. He then suggested that I had grounds to demand a divorce for desertion. But be that as it may, he immediately granted my claim and gave me full custody of Otterly. I don't see how joint custody of the child can work in this case. If Mrs. Thomas cannot effectively communicate with her legal representative on this matter, what chance does Mr. Thomas have of sharing with her the important decisions regarding their daughter's well-being? Beak lectured Marjorie's counsel. Mr. Thomas! said the old man, again addressing me directly. As of today, I give you full and exclusive custody of Otterly, and I fully terminate Mrs. Thomas's parental rights to the child, but with one caveat. The judge turned to Marjorie's attorney. If Mrs. Thomas wishes to appear before me in person within 21 days, I may be able to persuade her to reconsider her decision. Will you endeavor to inform her of this? Marjorie's solicitor replied that he would do his best to give her the information. Hearing the poor man's reply, the old man raised his eyebrows and turned his attention back to me. Well, Mr. Thomas, I don't hold out much hope of that happening, and I doubt I can be persuaded to change my mind. 
It surprises me that you haven't demanded child support from your wife? Frankly, I don't see much chance of collecting them, Your Honor, unless Marjorie ever returns to the country, I replied. The judge leaned forward and spoke briefly in a whisper to his secretary, then shuffled through some papers, looking for something on his desk. I think we'll still make a temporary order for a hundred pounds a month. It's only a nominal amount to set a precedent. Like you, I doubt very much whether you will ever get it. But if Mrs. Thomas returns to the jurisdiction of this court, we can adjust that amount in the future. I advise you to instruct your legal representatives to verify any assets Mrs. Thomas may have in the UK. That was it. I walked out of court a single man and with all the property gained in the marriage. And apparently any other property that Marjorie had in the country, if I wished, if we could find it. I never bothered to look for it. Checking the call log at home the following Monday, I noticed that there had been an international call the day before. Probably while I was mowing the lawn, that would explain why I hadn't heard the phone ringing. The call had obviously come from Marjorie. She was the only person who had called from abroad. Strangely, neither Otterly nor Rachel mentioned the call to me, nor, as usual, did they inform me of Marjorie's whereabouts. You can assume they didn't, but I know I figured it out. Although, since Otterly wasn't in court that week, I tried not to give much thought to her divorce. I wondered how the girls knew about the 21 days. I doubted that the social worker the court appointed to look after her interests would have told her. As time went on, Marjorie's calls to Otterly became more and more infrequent. I wasn't surprised, because from the few that were within earshot of me, I realized they were very one-sided. Not counting my daughter's subtle inquiries as to exactly where Marjorie was, but those too ceased as soon as her fancy man's divorce was settled. By the way, I have no idea how Otterly or Rachel found out about this information, that his divorce had already been settled. I think I concluded that, since he's local, his kids probably went to the same school as the girls. Perhaps the kids all conspired and shared information. But if that was the case, the girls didn't tell me anything. I suppose the same reasoning could be used to explain the information the girls originally had about who, when, etc., when Marjorie first made her statement and moved out. Adults too easily underestimate children's understanding of exactly what is going on. I can't remember now, but I think the divorce was final about four months ago. I took Otterly and Rachel to a movie one Saturday afternoon, and we were enjoying hamburgers at the local MacD's when Rachel announced that she and her mother would be moving home soon. I innocently inquired as to the reason, of course, and Rachel informed me that the lease on their apartment was up for renewal, but her mother thought the landlord wanted to raise the rent too much. No, at the time I didn't see or realize what was going on and that another conspiracy was afoot. Come on, they were two nine-year-old kids, and tricking me out of an ice cream or two or even a day out was completely expected. But the fact that they'd thought up and planned to trick me into inviting Andorra and Rachel to move in with Otterly and me, I hadn't even realized. They set the trap on Friday night when we all ate dinner together, prepared by Andorra before she left for her shift at the cab office. Otterly, seemingly innocently, asks Andorra if she's found a suitable apartment yet. Before Andorra could answer, Rachel started telling horror stories about the places they'd seen. Though Andorra did manage to find out that they weren't nearly as bad as Rachel had described them. For some reason, I had completely overlooked the fact that if Rachel had seen those apartments, Otterly had too because those two girls were always together, regardless of which one of us, Andorra, or I, was looking after them. Otterly then made a suggestion that, had I been a little more skeptical, I should have seen coming a mile away. Yeah, Ad, we have a spare guest room upstairs, remarked Otterly. Why don't Rachel and Aunt Andorra move in with us? Rachel has her own bed in my room anyway, and it would save us from having to move from house to house all the time. Actually, I have to admit, I thought Otterly's idea was a good one. It would save him from having to chase around town and Andor from having to pay rent, among other things. I looked at Andor for a clue, but she avoided meeting my gaze. I found myself in an awkward situation. If I had rejected the offer right away, Andorra might well have resented it. But on the other hand, Andorra might not like the idea, and I might embarrass her if I put the ball in her hands. I decided that the safest way out was to muddy the waters a bit. Well, honey. You see, well, sometimes there can be problems when a man and a woman who aren't married live in the same house. You know, some people might get the wrong idea. I stuttered. Surprisingly, Andor giggled. Geez, Pete, you sound like a real prude. 
No, Andor. I was just thinking of your reputation. My reputation? You've got to be kidding me! Do you want to know the real reason we're being forced out of our apartment? It's because I disappear every week on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday nights. What's more, I used to get a cab home in the mornings, but now I drive a brand new car. I don't understand. The Nissan isn't new. Yes, next to my neighbor's cars. Some of them are sure I could only afford a car like that if I had a certain night job. Andor sat and waited for me to digest what she'd said with a token expression on her face. You're kidding me, I gasped. No, I don't work, they wrote to my landlord. I told all of them that I work at a cab company, and I even talked to some of them when they called a cab, but the rumors don't stop. My God, the sooner you get out of there, the better. That's what I thought, but finding another decent apartment I could afford isn't as easy as it seems. What about Otterly's idea, since there's plenty of room? Are you sure? There was no enthusiasm in your words. Yeah, I bet you are. Without the girls, this place is like a morgue, and besides, you're not half as bad a cook as I am. Should I take that as a compliment? As for my cooking, yes. The room is over there if you want it, Andor. And from the look on those two faces, they can't wait. I pointed with a gesture to the two grinning faces of the children. We'll have to discuss the lease, suggested Andor. No, I don't think we will. Housekeeping isn't among my favorite things to do, and I've already told you that you're a better cook than I am. Maybe you'll become something of a home cook around here? Pete, I'd do it anyway, but I'd have to pay you something, at at least for heating, electricity, and housekeeping tax, insisted Andor. Let's save that for later. Right now I have to ask you if you're sure you want to move here. If you're inviting us, then yes, we'd love to. Then let's assume the deal is done. When do you want to move in? Oh yes, how about... Well, this apartment is furnished. Don't worry, most of my things aren't worth worrying about. A lot of them can be thrown away. I sold all the good stuff years ago, right after Tony left, when I was short of money. What happened? I asked. But I knew from the look in Andorra's eyes that she would tell me when the kids weren't around. I'd been married to Marjorie long enough to recognize that expression. I was aware that Andor's husband had been killed in a traffic accident a few years ago, but I never knew the details. A little while later, when we went to walk Andorra in the Nissan, I heard a distinct smacking sound behind me and turned around to see what it was, and found Otterly and Rachel standing there looking at me with a butter-won't-melt-in-your-mouth look on their faces. The girls moved into the house the following week. Most of Andor's furniture had been thrown away, but some things still made their way into the house. Other things were stored in the garage, and her television and music center ended up in the girls' bedroom. The house was suddenly a full-fledged home again. Even the guys at work remarked on my improved mood. There were also comments that I didn't join them for drinks after work as often. But I had a daughter. Well, two daughters to bring home and read them bedtime stories every night. Oh yeah, my traveling days were practically over when Marge left. Not knowing how events would unfold, I kind of tempered my fervor a bit. My boss relented and started sending other guys in my place. I just didn't volunteer to go anymore if I could help it. Shortly after moving Andorra, I began to fall in love with this woman, although at the time I thought I was very good at not showing it. What did you expect? Andorra was a pretty dainty piece of real estate by any standards. Maybe a year or so younger than me, she seemed to be able to present herself in immaculate form, regardless of what she was or wasn't wearing. Sure. I'd seen her pass between the guest room and the bathroom a few times, wrapped only in a bath sheet, but that was it. Andor had a killer sense of humor and never seemed to resent the girls or me, no matter what the little pranksters did. She apparently paid no attention to my, uh, idiosyncrasies. Look, I never claimed I wouldn't be a bloodthirsty angel to live with. I was in love with Andorra from the first time I laid eyes on it, so it was to be expected. I think Carol was the first to realize I was hooked that Christmas, she and Frank had brought their family to Boxing Day. Andor was fussing over the dinner she was making. Have you told her yet? asked Carol, as we set the table together in the dining room. To whom and what did you say? replied I. Of course, Andorra, brother. I'm sorry, kid, you lost me. What was I supposed to tell her? That you're in love with her, you fool, announced Carol. Do what? 
Don't be silly, Carol. Come on, Pete, I'm reading you like a book. You're even more hooked on Andorra than Stephanie Mathers. Oh, I'd better explain Stephanie Mathers. She was my first love when we were all in high school together. Carol's friend and I worshipped the ground this girl walked on for several years before I got up the courage to ask her out. She led me on for a while and then broke my heart by leaving me for dead. Stephanie was immediately and irrevocably declared persona non grati by my sister and her friends. Some of them comforted me over the following months. God, they made sure I forgot about Stephanie as soon as possible. Of course I've grown attached to her. She's a very nice person, Carol. But I'm in a delicate situation. The status quo suits us both. If I do anything to upset the balance, oh my God, I could smash the apple cart. Peter, this woman has a crush on you as much as you have on her. You dance around each other like schoolboys in love. What the hell are you talking about, Carol? Pete, to get from one end of the room to the other, you both take the long way around so there's no chance of you, heaven forbid, touching each other. So we don't want to invade each other's personal space. Nonsense. There are only two reasons why two people living in the same house would do such a thing. Either you hate each other, which I somehow doubt, because no one has ever heard a single word slip between you, or you're in love with each other. And don't try to bullshit me. You've never once exchanged a thought-provoking joke. That's unusual for two people who spend so much time in close proximity to each other. Think of all the jokes you exchange with the girls in the office. No, you're both too afraid of ruining what you have. So you think Andor is partial to me? My God, Pete, she's dancing the same thing you are. You both dance to the same tune. Even the girls can see that. So what am I supposed to do? The hell of it, Peter. Tell her how you feel, I guess. Come on, she's not the first woman you've called on to work your golden tongue. You knew how to get girls until you got involved with that bitch. You never liked Marjorie, did you? No, I never trusted her. It seemed to me that she had you wrapped around her finger and then led you around by the nose. About the same way Otterly and Rachel are doing it now, but I doubt you'll ever see it. The difference is that those two little girls really love you, which I never thought Marjorie did. Oh, you are mistaken, Carol. Of course, Marjorie loved me when we were married. Think what you want, Pete. You've seen love. I've seen a girl who got off easy. You had a hell of a job for a young man your age, and you actually brought home the bacon. Christ, Frank wasn't getting half your paycheck when I married him. I was always convinced that Marjorie only saw you as a pound sign. No, you're wrong, Carol. Never mind, it doesn't matter now, does it? Peter, someone has given you a second chance at happiness. There's a woman in the kitchen who I'm sure is in love with you. You'll just have to find a way to melt the ice. No sooner had the conversation gone any farther than we heard Andorra approaching. She entered the dining room to see how the meal preparations were going, and Carol and I had to change the subject. During this meal, Carol kept catching my eye and making subtle head gestures toward Andorra. She also seemed to be enjoying a private joke with Otterly and Rachel, but I don't think anyone else noticed it. Over the next few days, I almost broached the subject of Andorra several times, but ducked at the last minute. It was New Year's Eve and Andorra was working. Carol and Frank picked up the girls so I could go to a party with some friends from the office. I didn't want to leave the girls, but everyone insisted. Conspiracy again, I don't think so. Too many unconnected people. What happened that night must have been a coincidence. It was about four in the morning, and the party was winding down. Those who were going home had already gone home, and most of the others had gone their separate ways. Unable to find a single comfortable vacant place to spend the night, and having drunk too much falling water to even think about driving home, well, unless I wanted to get there in one piece, I hailed a cab. Hey, gorgeous. Why don't you send one of the guys to take me home? Maybe not exactly the words I'd used, but pretty much what I'd said to Andor when she answered the call at the cab service. Are you mad, Pete? asked Andor. You bet, babe. I had a hard time deciding which of those two phones to call. I'll bring one of the boys over in five minutes. Thank you, sweetheart. Oh, and Pete! Yes, beautiful? Try not to throw up all over the back seat. Have you ever seen me throw up when I'm furious? I've never seen you drunk, Peter. I can't imagine what you'd do. Would you be surprised? You bet. 
Now Phil's hitting the road, and please don't make a mess in his car. We have enough guys trying to get the smell of vomit out of their cars as it is. Your word is my command, my love. If that's all you meant? What? Never mind, Phil's already out the door. Why don't you try to find your way to his car? said Andor, laughing. Then the line cut off. Jesus, Pete, you're bleeding out of your skin, said Driver Phil, who obviously knew who I was, even if I didn't know who he was, as he helped me into the back seat of his cab. But when he got behind the wheel, even in my inebriated state, I realized he wasn't headed for my house. You're going the wrong way, I told him, or more accurately, I guess, sassed him. You're going to need someone to put you to bed, and I don't intend to do the honor. I think I know who will volunteer. It's pretty quiet around here now. One of the guys can sit on the bleeding phones for the rest of the night. Honestly, I must have fallen asleep, because the next thing I knew, Phil and Andorra were dragging me from the back seat of the car. Maybe I did act a little helpless, especially when Andor clung to my arm to help me to the door and through it. I needed Phil's help to successfully navigate the stairs to the bedroom, though. As soon as he was gone, I started playing possum again, and Andor began loosening my clothes, trying to make me comfortable. You know that you can do some stupid things while intoxicated. Because of your lowered level of restraint, you can get away with things you would never dare to say when sober. For me, it was the perfect opportunity to try my luck. But perhaps the booze didn't help me choose the best words. Suddenly, the perfect opportunity presented itself. Andor was leaning over me, staring straight into my eyes from very close up. You know, you're one hell of an attractive little Andorra, muttered I. And what does that mean? she asked. That you're good enough to eat and I'm hungry. I mouthed it slurred, probably with a drunken smirk on my face. Oh, yes, really? Well, I suspect that if you ate anything, you wouldn't be able to keep it down for long. How much have you had to drink today? Not enough. Jesus, Pete, you're as mean as a newt. Yeah, but if I drank a little more, I'd have the courage to tell you how much I love you. A wide smile appeared on Andor's face. I'll believe it when you can tell me sober. Now get some sleep and we'll see how bad your head is in the morning. Good night, Peter, she added, then rose and left the room. No, you can't leave, I insisted. I might get sick and I might suffocate. Well, where am I supposed to sleep then? I grabbed Andor's arm as she stood and pulled her gently so that she fell onto the bed beside me, where she didn't try to get up. Nothing more was said, and eventually I must have dozed off. Well, probably pretty quickly, since I had so much booze in me. Andorra was right. The daylight pouring in through the bedroom windows was not helping my condition, and I was somewhat disappointed to find that she was no longer in the bed beside me. I wanted to lift my head off the pillow and suddenly realized that wasn't a good idea. I must have groaned in pain. Here, have a drink! I heard Andor's voice from behind me. What is it? I asked, shielding my eyes from the sunlight as I rolled over to look in her direction. Well, it can't be poison until you marry me, right? I need to make sure I can get insurance on your life before I blow you off. How do you know I won't turn the table over and bump you first? I replied. If Andor wants to play comedian, I figured I'd try to be witty too. No, you can't do that. You have two daughters you need someone to look after. One of them is yours! They don't see it that way, Peter. They like to think of themselves as sisters, and they both think of you as their father. What about you? I think I'm considered Otterly's mother now too. Haven't you noticed that Aunt Andor has stopped being a mom lately? She's called me mom several times in the last week. Yeah? I hadn't noticed. I know, and you didn't give a hoot when Rachel started calling you daddy a few weeks ago. Oh, I'm not very observant, am I? Did she really call me her father? Daddy to be exact, Peter. She's been calling you daddy for about a month now. Even Carol and Frank have noticed it. Oh, and you discussed it with Carol at Boxing Day? I discussed a lot of things with Carol on Boxing Day, Peter. Ah, that explains it then. What? Why is she already planning her wedding outfit? I replied with as much of a smile as possible, considering I had this little guy with Thor's hammer running around in my head. Andor sat looking at me, 
still holding the potion she had prepared for me in her hand. Well, I asked after she apparently hadn't responded in ages. Andor sat with a confused expression on her face. I expected her to ask a question in response to my comment, but it didn't come as I'd hoped. And what is it? she replied. So are you going to marry me or not? You didn't ask me to do that. I know I'm a coward. I was trying to get an answer from you before I asked. It's much better not to look like a prize prune when I get rejected. Hmm, well, we'll see. I guess you wouldn't look like a fruitcake if you asked. But, replied Andor. But what? I have a confession to make to you before you commit to it. Sounds serious. Should I be worried? No, but it is. I'm not a widow, Peter. Tony's not dead. In fact, legally, I was never married to him. Or rather, I was married, but I wasn't. I think I'm losing something in translation, Andor. Tony was a bigamist, Pete. He was already married when he married me, so legally my marriage to him is null and void. Oops. Can you say that? Tony actually married three of us at different times, and he fled the country during the trial. That's why I told Rachel he's dead. If he's ever tracked down, he'll be in jail for years. Not that I think they'll do that. The bastards have probably already tricked some other stupid cow into marrying him. So you're not a widow and you've never been married, I said. No, technically I'm an unmarried mother. It's just a lot less complicated to tell everyone I'm a widow. In that case, would you do me the honor of... I never got around to asking the rest of the question, and Andor never got around to answering it. I'm not even sure where the damn drink she brought me went. But we spent the next hour or so rolling around on the bed and the floor like a couple of teenagers, my headache almost forgotten. No, it wasn't. We just kissed and hugged and whispered silly sweet nothings to each other. It was fun, although my head was still acting up. With a head like that, I don't think I could have performed. By the time Frank brought the girls home, it was about three o'clock in the afternoon. And Dora and I were sitting in the kitchen, making plans and thinking about how to break the news to the girls. But we didn't have to say anything to them. The little rascals seemed to get it right away. Maybe it was because Andor was almost sitting on my lap when they came through the door. In any case, they stopped where they were, looked at us for a few seconds, then greeted each other again, and then went around the table and hugged us both. I think we both thought we had flashing neon signs on our heads when Frank, upon entering the kitchen, did a quick double take and simply said, Congratulations! When? Which Andor and I translated as, What date have we set for the wedding? This necessitated further discussion, which involved Carol, whom Frank had telephoned. Eventually a date was set, rather arbitrarily, for mid-February. Andora and I wanted a rather modest celebration, while our girls wanted something more extravagant. I think we settled on something average. We decided to have the wedding itself at the registry office, and afterwards to have a rather lavish but small reception. Neither Andorra nor I had many living relatives. Afterwards. The registry office was chosen because, well, there were no announcements to read and no entries in the parish newspaper to worry about. Announcements like Maiden of this parish and In the Presence of Her Daughter might have confused some people. Andor was supposed to be a widow. After Frank went home, Andor had the delicate task of giving her application to the supervisor at the taxicab company. My wife wouldn't work the night shift for anything in the world, for reasons too numerous to mention, and personal pride or distrust are not part of the equation. It's more of a personal preference. It pissed me off to sleep, or rather, not sleep, alone. Andor and I had another big decision to make when it was time for us to go to bed that night. In the end, we decided to go to separate bedrooms until the wedding. We both realized that it would be hard for us to justify any of our positions on extramarital sex to the girls when they got older if they saw us sharing a room before the wedding. But that doesn't mean I didn't develop the habit of running home for lunch on most days as soon as the girls got back to school. Okay, I took a few long lunches, but no one in the office minded most likely because of the further improvement in my overall mood. The following weekend, Andor worked her last shifts at the taxi depot. It took several cabs to take all the flowers and boxes of chocolates home on Sunday morning. Then we had to limit the girls for a few weeks. It wasn't Sunday night in Andorra. Some of the drivers and their wives invited us to dinner and some fun at a local pub. Cabs were in short supply in town that evening. The wedding came almost before we realized it. 
It went very well considering our girls were flawless bridesmaids. I think Andorra and Carol spent more time making them look perfect than my bride. But as I think I've said before, Andorra can look good in just about anything. Andor and I didn't have a honeymoon per se. One night in the honeymoon suite at the luxury hotel where we held the reception. The girls went home for the night with Frank and Carol's family. Our master plan was to get away with the girls for most of the school summer vacation that year. That first year, we spent five weeks driving around Florida, the Caribbean, and Southern California. Never staying anywhere for more than a few days, we saw just about everything we could see and experience in the allotted time. It was only a week or two after the wedding, and when I got home from work in the evening, I immediately realized that something was wrong. The girls looked quite happy, but Andor was annoyed about something. It wasn't until the girls went to bed that she told me what was bothering her. Does Rachel know that Tony isn't dead? She informed me as soon as I came downstairs, putting both girls down and reading them each a chapter from their book. Jesus, how did she know? I asked in surprise. I was pretty sure we'd never discussed it while the girls were in the house. I have no idea. Though I've suspected something was wrong ever since we moved here. Remember those pictures by the girls' beds? Well, the beds in the girls' room are parallel to each other. There were three small closets, one on each side and a third in the middle. On the center, one hung two pictures and Dora and me. On the outer ones were pictures of Marjorie and Tony, respectively. Andora explained that lately, she had found that the girls often put pictures of Marjorie and Tony in the drawers. It suddenly dawned on me that I hadn't seen either painting that evening. Finally, Andora asked the girls why they were hiding the pictures. Rachel replied, They don't need us. We don't want to look at their pictures. Further discussion proved to Andora that Rachel knew full well that her father had not died in a traffic accident, but had run away, although she did not seem to know why. Andora, out of embarrassment, decided to leave Rachel in the dark. She didn't want to explain to the child that she was technically an illegitimate child. Although Andora had been worried for some time about Rachel's reaction to the information that her father was out there, the child didn't seem to mind. Personally, I thought the information helped the girls feel closer to each other. Andora turned out to be the perfect wife. Even better than the perfect wife, she was an amazing mother to both of our girls. Not only was she great with the kids, but she was extremely patient with me when things got hectic in the office. Yes, no matter what Otterly claims, I do have flaws, but Andorra seems to overlook them, never once mentioning them. She has the most wonderful sense of humor and has come up with many ways to wind me up in the evening and tease me until the kids go to bed, or we do. Sometimes my nights can be very tiring. By early summer, the number of phone calls from Marjorie to Otterly had virtually dropped to zero. I'm not surprised that Otterly changed course, went on the offensive, and became very persistent when Marjorie did call. I know she was mad at her mother, but both Andorra and I had to step in and reprimand Otterly for referring to Andorra as new mommy in her conversation with Marjorie. Otterly discarded this trick and instead went on about how much fun we had as a family going out, regularly mentioning daddy's wife and my sister Rachel. Andor and I have had several discussions about Otterly's attitude toward Marjorie and how she talks to her on the phone. But in the end, we concluded that it was impossible to create an endless list of words and phrases that Otterly was forbidden to use toward her. Otterly, with Rachel's connivance, is bound to come up with new ones, no matter what we forbid. We decided that Marjorie had made her own bed that day in the kitchen. Now she would have to get used to lying in the damn thing. Before we could get back from vacation, Otterly and Rachel started talking about mom and dad again. Andora and I had a hard time understanding what they were implying for a while, but then we realized they were asking if we were really their mom and dad, and I blame the internet. Suddenly, Andor and I began finding printouts all over the house regarding adoption procedures, with, we assumed, the intention of encouraging Andor to adopt Otterly and me to adopt Rachel. The girls also researched the legal intricacies of changing Rachel's name to Thomas, and even printed out the appropriate forms. As for the idea of adoption, after some discussion, Andorra and I decided that it had to be either one or both. Rachel's father, although he had abandoned her and Andorra, still retained his legal rights over her. We ended up putting the problem in the hands of the same attorney who handled my divorce. It took over a year, but eventually we were able to get Tony's parental rights terminated and both adoptions took place. Coincidentally, or by our lawyer's intent, 
The same judge who presided over my divorce case was presiding over Tony's termination of parental rights, and I strongly suspect that may have had something to do with his decision. Legally, our family now consisted of Mr. and Mrs. Thomas and our daughters Otterly and Rachel. We discussed adding to the family, but in the end we decided not to add to the family, which was what we had intended. Shortly after we were married, I got a promotion at work, and with the promotion came a bigger salary and the ability to delegate more responsibilities. Our summer trips became regular, and I really think Andorra planned them as a kind of compensation for my lack of time to travel when I was younger. In our second year of marriage, we spent five weeks traveling around Europe. On the third, we visited India, a surprisingly large country, and Sri Lanka. On the fourth, we visited Australia and New Zealand, and yes, we miscalculated by going there in the middle of their winter. But we're British. It was hard for us to notice the difference. By the time our fifth summer came around, we knew a lot about traveling. Otterly and Rachel, both 14 years old by then, had their own video cameras, and they were already doing a good job of documenting our travels. Canada, the northern U.S., and Alaska were all planned for that year, and for most of the winter and spring, all three of my girls made detailed plans. By then, I had left them to their own devices, only occasionally mentioning the name of some unusual place I had heard of years ago and knowing that we would stop there sometime during the trip. But there was one thing I don't think either of us considered. About two years after we were married, Andor and I started getting Christmas cards from Marjorie. Otterly always got Christmas and birthday cards from her. But we had no idea why she suddenly decided to send Christmas cards to us. We couldn't reciprocate because none of the cards had a return address. However, the thing is, and I, and I suppose the rest of the family didn't pay attention to this, they all had Canadian stamps. This would lead anyone who thought about it to think that Marjorie and Ronald had settled somewhere in this country. Unfortunately, Marjorie was rarely mentioned in our house anymore, and I don't think she called Otterly on the phone for several years, so no one brought it up. As always, the master plan for our extended summer vacation that year changed along the way. When the girls informed me that we had no chance of visiting all the places we wanted to in the allotted time, and this after we had made some very strong cuts to the list. In the end, we decided to draw an arbitrary line across the continent, just as we had drawn a line across it a few years earlier. We will visit the West that summer and leave the East for another year. We arrived in Winnipeg on an Air Canada flight in late June, and after spending a day or two exploring the historic sites around the city, this is not a travelogue, so I won't go into detail, we took a tour in a rental car. From Manitoba, we traveled west to Saskatchewan, then turned south and almost back through the Dakotas, Nebraska, and Kansas before turning west and then north again, driving through Colorado and Wyoming, where we spent a few days at what is known as a dude ranch. The horses were pleasant to ride, but I think I'll stick to English saddles in the future. As comfortable as the western-type saddles were, I got the feeling that it wouldn't be so easy to get out of them if something went wrong. However, I didn't have the slightest confidence that it would happen. The rain on my neck was an interesting experience too. There are two theories about riding horses or motorcycles when they get hit by wheels. Stay with it and hope you manage to regain control, or back off and hope you fall to the ground, get to your feet and run. The prospect of being on a horse or motorcycle with a squealing engine and spinning rear wheel landing on me has never been my idea of a good time. Eventually, we entered Montana and stopped in a town I'd heard about somewhere and had always wanted to visit. I must have read about this place in some western. After checking into a hotel, motel, or whatever you want to call it, we headed to a restaurant, I guess a diner we had seen nearby. The restaurant was crowded and a little noisy. All the customers were chatting with each other. But suddenly, there was a great rumble, followed by absolute silence. Everyone fell silent, as is always the case in such cases. One of the waitresses dropped a tray of food for the poor. It's one of those reflex actions that you can't control, isn't it? And Dora and I, like everyone else in the place, started looking to see who exactly had so clumsily prevented us from eating by dropping the tray. A rather rash act, because surely the culprit would have been embarrassed enough to make a fuss. He certainly didn't want to be stared at by every passerby in the place. I quickly located the culprit and to my surprise recognized her. What's more, it was obvious that she'd noticed me, too. And on reflection, I realized that it was probably her recognition that had caused her to drop the damn tray. The poor woman was standing there with her mouth open and her eyes wide, staring straight at me. I could tell from Andorra's reaction that she, too, recognized the woman. 
Anyway, both Andorra and I had to react by saying almost the same thing in unison to our girls. Eat your dinner, Rachel Otterly. You have nothing to worry about. Andor turned to Rachel, and I turned to Otterly. Although they were now our girls, we had both legally adopted each other's daughters. Even after five years, we still had a tendency to punish our own child first. Not that it mattered. Both kids were twisting in their seats, trying to get a glimpse of the culprit of the commotion. Recognizing the woman, Otterly turned around almost instantly and, I believe, uttered the words, So be it! under her breath, then returned to her meal as if nothing had happened. Rachel stared for a moment longer before the waitress turned and left the public area of the restaurant. Then she looked at me, smiled sweetly, then shifted her gaze to her mother's eyes before returning to her food, just as Otterly had. After the waitress left, many customers looked in our direction. Some may have looked in our direction before the waitress left, but I didn't notice. Anyway, they all realized that the incident was caused by my relatives and or my presence. Andor and I and the girls tried to ignore the stares and continued our meal as best we could. I guess the grass wasn't as green as it looked, whispered Andor whispered to me as we followed the two girls running to the car. What do you mean? I replied, perhaps a little more curtly than I intended. I think it's safe to assume she's no longer with Ronald if she's working here. Most likely one of them cheated on the other. They say once you cheat, you always cheat, I replied. But she didn't cheat on you. That stupid bitch just dumped you and Otterly. You're not trying to trick me that they didn't consummate their relationship before the divorce. Besides, in my opinion, leaving your daughter is tantamount to cheating. You can be sure that either she couldn't keep her legs crossed or he couldn't keep them in his pants. Does it matter? Not if she doesn't try to cause trouble here and now. Otterly was confused enough as it was. There's no need to put her through more turmoil. It's too late for her to try something like that, Pete. Besides, I think Otterly handled it a lot better than you did. After all, it was the girls who... Don't say that, Andor. I know exactly what those little ones did, and I'm glad we have a couple of manipulative little minxes. Though sometimes I have to wonder how far their manipulations go. What do you mean? No big deal, but it was obvious they were working to a plan. Sometimes I wonder how far in advance they laid everything out. Don't worry, I couldn't be more pleased than I am now. I just get curious sometimes. By this time we had gotten to the car, I unlocked the doors with the remote as we pulled up and the kids jumped into the back seats. I opened the near front door and held it open for Andorra. But she didn't get in. She came right up to me, wrapped her arms around my neck and kissed me. The two little devils sitting in the back of the car murmured and shouted approvingly. This was followed by comments like not in public and would you two please wait until you get to your room? One might think that these were rather disrespectful and cavalier comments coming from two 14-year-olds. But both of our daughters were very mature for their age. My goodness, how quickly they had to grow up. And Dora had lost her husband when Rachel was six and had lived alone for many years. Otterly saw her mother leave us and, almost publicly, disown her when she was eight years old. I assure you I didn't handle that event too well. But my daughter, with Rachel's help, began to behave like a much more mature person. Very suddenly, Andor interrupted the kiss and pulled back slightly. We have an audience, she whispered, peering over my shoulder. I looked back and saw Marjorie standing in the kitchen doorway watching us. Do you think Otterly should, suggested Andor. Yeah, I don't think we have a choice, I replied. I was well aware that I would have to go back later to talk to Marjorie, or rather confront her, and that would likely lead to us arranging for Otterly to meet with her mother alone. Frankly, it was too good an opportunity to pass up. We'd have gotten that side of things out of the way anyway. Rubbed off. Andor leaning against the car spoke while I was still pondering. Your mom is there. I think you should go see her. Do I have to? replied Otterly. She is your mother, Otterly. Now please do what we ask you to do or else many years from now, when you are older, you will be sorry you missed this opportunity. Otterly shrugged and started to climb out of the car. I don't want to see her. Maybe Rachel will ride with me? No, we're just here. We won't be missing from your sight, assured Andor assured her. After getting out of the car, Otterly, with noticeable reluctance and a few dejected glances back at us, made her way toward her mother, 
stopping ten feet away from her. Marjorie apparently said something, we couldn't hear, and took a step toward her, but Otterly immediately took a step back. It was a little frustrating that we couldn't hear what they were saying to each other, although I think Otterly did talk a lot. We noticed that if Marjorie moved any closer to Otterly, the child would retreat. That's not good, muttered Andor, apparently so Rachel wouldn't hear her. But as soon as she said it, Otterly turned and ran back to the car, jumped into her seat without a word, slammed the door shut, and began fastening her seatbelt. When I looked back, the doorway where Marjorie had been standing was empty, and I assumed she'd gone back inside. I would have preferred to get in my car and get out of there, but Andorra had a different plan, and she must have been halfway to the door before Otterly could fasten his seatbelt. So I stood there like a lemon for about ten minutes until Andorra came back. I cast a questioning glance at Andorra as she finally climbed back into the car. In response, I got one of those looks where Andor seemed to be looking at me, but her eyes quickly darted to the two girls in the back seat. The message was shut up and drive. We'll discuss this later. After lunch, we planned to walk along the path along the river and see the waterfalls for which the town was named. We had the impression that the hydroelectric dams had stolen some of their original grandeur, but they were still impressive. As usual on these walks, Andorra and I never overdo hiking if we can help it. Two girls got ahead of us, and that allowed Andorra and I to talk. So what did she say? He left, dumped her two years ago when he picked up some waitress in this town. It's just as we suspected. But I wonder why she didn't go home to the UK. He left, leaving her with the motel bill. The motel was understaffed in the restaurant, so she figured she could stay and work off the bill. Apparently, she's sharing a room with another woman. Anyway, they both work in the restaurant during the day, and at night they serve drinks at the bar behind the road. Sounds like fun. What else is she supposed to do, Pete? Gets herself laid every night by some bar fly, I suppose. No need to be nasty, Peter. Marjorie made a mistake, and now she seems to be paying for it. Anyway, you'll meet her when she finishes her work at the restaurant at 6 o'clock. She only has a couple hours before she has to be on bar duty, so you can chat while I take the kids out for a bite to eat. Andorra, what the hell am I supposed to tell her? You need to finish, Peter, no matter what you believe. You need to sit down and talk to her, and remember that she's Otterly's mother. Do you wish she remembered that? Marjorie said the same thing, Peter. She regrets her action, and I believe she would like to apologize to Otterly as well as to you. Unfortunately, I don't think Otterly is ready to accept that apology just yet. That was obvious from what happened at lunch. But in time, I'm sure she will. We'll just have to make sure we don't lose her again. Are you being magnanimous about all this, considering what Tony did to you? Pete, is there any point in going through life with hate in your heart? What Tony did to me is worse than what Marjorie did to you, or even Otterly. You know, for a while I hated him and the other women he tricked into marrying him. And then one day we were all sitting in the waiting room at the police station, and I realized we were all in the same boat. We had all been tricked and none of us were to blame, so we became friends. Tony! What's the point of wasting time cursing the bastard? If he ever shows up, I'll report him to the police as soon as I get the chance. But I'm not going to waste time and emotion on hating him. I have more important people to worry about. Andor pulled me to her and kissed my cheek. Besides, think about it. If Marjorie hadn't run off with that what's-his-name, where would we be now? Good idea, Andor. I know it's my love. We'd better hurry, it's four o'clock now. I was waiting in the parking lot of the restaurant when Marjorie came off duty. She came out with another very dark-haired woman who scrutinized me carefully before going on her way. Marjorie looked nervous, not the confident woman I had last seen in the kitchen when she was laying down the law all those years ago. She still looked quite attractive, though. Hi, Peter. Thanks for coming over. The bar must be quiet at this time of day. Why don't we go over there and talk? I didn't speak in response, but gestured for her to take the initiative. I followed Marjorie to a booth at the back of the bar. It was obvious that we were expected. I noticed the dark-haired woman sitting behind the bar, talking to the bartender as we entered. I also noticed that all the booths next to ours were empty. A dark-haired woman walked behind us and set two beers on the table, then said something to Marjorie, I think in Spanish. Marjorie only nodded in response. 
I assumed she had picked up the language during her wanderings. You wanted to see me, Marjorie, said I, reminding her that I had not asked for this meeting. I, I just wanted to say I'm sorry, Peter, she finally whispered. I only now caught her words. No, you have done me a great favor, replied I. Come on, I'm not cut out to be a bloodthirsty diplomat. Yes, Andor got the better end of the deal. I should have realized that she'd latch on to you as soon as I left, she replied bitterly. It was the other way around, Marjorie, as soon as I laid eyes on Andorra. I'm not quite sure how I wanted to end that sentence. Perhaps I thought that if I had met Andor before Marjorie left, I might have been the one to perform the act of walking. Maybe I'm wishful thinking, but somehow I doubt I would have done that. I'm the kind of person who is too bound by duty and other things to act so selfishly. Sometimes you wonder if this is a failure. What happened to Loverboy after all? I asked Marjorie. And where did that creep get all his money? You know he left his wife and kids without a penny, so she seized all his bank accounts. Ronald's money? What a laugh! You mean everybody else's money? He was a crook, Peter. He's wanted everywhere. I wouldn't be surprised if that's why he left me in the end. I helped him in some of his scams, and we had to leave Argentina quickly when my picture was in the local papers. I think he crossed the border into Canada when he found out the FBI showed up at the motel looking for him. Coincidentally, with one of the waitresses from the diner. Ironically, I'm now doing the job of that bleeding waitress. Wasn't the FBI after you? No, pretty much yes, but I made a deal with them. If I'm willing to testify against Ronald when they get to him, then they agreed not to throw the book at me. And in return, I got a slap on the wrist. Two years probation for aiding a fugitive to escape or some other nonsense. Mind you, I'm stuck in the country until they find the creep, and I'll have to report to the authorities every week or so. But it doesn't interfere too much because Buster, the deputy sheriff I report to, is here or at the diner most of the time. Are you still in debt? I was up to my ass in it. Like a prune, I signed over almost everything, including Ronald's rental car, and the bitch drove off in it. I've almost paid it all off, but there's still a few thousand dollars of debt left. No, Pete, I can't. Marjorie saw me pull out my checkbook. For once in your life, do as you're told, Marjorie. Okay, I'll draw this up for 5,000 pounds. That's $10,000. That should get you out of debt and give you something to lean on if you need it. If you decide to return to the UK in the future, when and if they catch this creep, we'll help you find a place and get settled. But don't think that gives you the right to interfere and spoil our family. Oh, and you know the courts have stripped you of all parental rights to Otterly, don't you? She made that clear to me this morning. Oh, I'm sorry, that's not why we sent her. That's what I realized when Andor walked into the kitchen. Pete, I was stupid. I really never meant to hurt you in Otterly like that. I don't know, I just got confused by all of Ronald's exciting stories. It wasn't very interesting, I assure you. Marjorie, that was all a long time ago. To tell you the truth, I'm just glad you're safe and sound. But Otterly and I have a new life now, and I'm afraid you are no longer a part of it. Though Andor and I will try to make sure Otterly keeps in touch with you. That's more than I deserve, Peter, and I really don't deserve this check. Well, you'd better take it. It will ease my conscience a little when we leave here tomorrow. In the morning, we shall come to the diner for breakfast. Perhaps we can get Otterly to speak to you civilly once more. I don't deserve the kindness you show me, Peter. No, Marjorie. I had to make my point, even if I tried to convince myself otherwise. But you're Otterly's mother, and there's nothing I can do about it. Now, if you don't mind, I'd like to go back to my family. Sure, I'm sorry, Pete. I got up and walked away without looking back. When I tracked down the girls, you could say they were all waiting for me, breathless. I think that's the right expression. I took Andor aside and told her briefly about my conversation with Marjorie and the money I'd given her. She doesn't deserve you! That was Andor's only comment when I mentioned the check. That's pretty much what she said, I replied, kissing my wife. But you want to! Thank you, was all she replied to the remark. A little later, I contacted Otterly alone and was about to start the routine on You Only Have One Birth Mother when she informed me that Andorra and Rachel had already arrived. From that point on, the conversation didn't go as I had planned. Otterly informed me that she would now be glad to talk to her mother the next morning.
and would also try to keep her mouth shut. She added the condition that she would not be alone with her mother, and Rachel or I would have to be present with her. When I inquired why, I was curtly informed that one of us was always present during the fun. I don't know how I took that statement. I left it without comment. The next morning, they, Marjorie, Otterly, and Rachel sat at a nearby table and talked for a long time. I can only assume that Marjorie's friends were covering for her, because I'm sure she had work to do. The only part of the conversation that Andorra and I overheard was two kids raving about how well the roses were growing in the garden at their house. Anyway, all three of them had smiles on their faces most of the time. As we drove away, Marjorie walked to the car with us and kissed both girls goodbye. She then turned to Andor and me. These two are very lucky. They have found themselves the best mom and dad in the world. She said this, somewhat taking me by surprise, and then turned and ran back into the restaurant. I guess she cried on the run. I kissed my wife, then we got in the car and drove north to the border in Calgary. From the way they were looking in the rearview mirror, I don't think any of the kids were looking back or were particularly concerned that we had left this town behind. Epilogue After we returned home that year, Marjorie kept in touch with her. Andor made a habit of writing to her fairly regularly, I believe. We never found out if the FBI had tracked Ronald down. But less than a year later, we learned that Marjorie was going to marry her deputy sheriff, or whatever his name was. We had a family gathering, and after much heartache, it was decided that we would decline the family's invitation to attend Marjorie's wedding. But I managed to slip in there alone for a few days to attend. Don't ask me why, but for some reason I felt I had to do it. Buster, or Buddy as everyone called him, turned out to be a really nice guy once I got to know him better. He even picked me up at the airport and introduced me to all his friends and family. I learned from Buddy that Marjorie had been very frank and open with him from the beginning. She admitted to everything she had done and told him how much she regretted what she had done in the past. It turned out that Buddy had arranged with several of his trucker buddies to send her Christmas cards, etc. To us from various cities in Canada. I believe Marjorie was trying to hide from us the true circumstances she was in. It's a little weird to give your ex-wife away at her wedding, but I guess some idiot had to do the job. Maybe that's why I went, to kind of put a stop to the whole thing. I don't believe Otterly and Rachel were figuring out where I'd gone for those five days, but they could have done it. Those two were always one step ahead of me in just about everything. I... To be honest, they and Andorra still are. Over the next few years, we received news that Marjorie had given birth to two boys. We never saw them, though, except in pictures. Now that they are a little older, I believe the boys have fairly regular contact with Otterly and Rachel, but neither of my daughters mention them or Marjorie to me very often. Otterly and Rachel ended up marrying two brothers. Sometimes I feel really sorry for these poor girls. The girls are still incredibly close to each other and definitely play a major role in these marriages. When our two girls are scheming together, it takes a man to come out on top. I don't think I've ever been able to do that. They both have two children, and, suspiciously from my point of view, in both cases the girls were born remarkably close to each other, both in date and physically. And Dora and I have enjoyed watching our grandchildren grow up and become very much like their mothers. I retired as managing director last year, and Andor and I are now enjoying an eight-month round-the-world trip. We've been pondering whether we'll find somewhere we'll want to settle down. But to be honest, I think our daughters and their families will pull us home to the UK again. We haven't sold the house, the girls wouldn't let us because of the roses. God knows how much time they spend there tending to it all, but we get regular reports. Just this morning, while checking the mail, I got a picture of my garden from them, titled, It's been a good year for roses! Life goes on! That's it. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. So subscribe to my channel and watch the next video.